Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Good morning, 10 o'clockers in the house. I love it. Hey, let me just tell you this right now, okay? The 8 o'clock, I mean, we, we did. We had a great service. We did. But how many know that we can go from good to gooder, right? And then at the 12 o'clock, we're going to go from gooder to greatest. But I want to I wanna make sure that we all stay engaged today. Um, we are in this series that we kicked off last week. If you weren't here, you can watch it on live stream. There's a lot that I laid as a foundation, and I just want to hit some more stuff this week. I'm going to take my time today. And just expose some things that maybe you thought that you probably wouldn't call fear. But the reality is that fear has many family members. It has brothers, sisters. It has aunts and uncles and cousins. And it has all kinds of stuff. So my goal today is to, is to get us to a place where we can be brutally. Everybody say brutally. Because it's brutal when you come to the reality. But it's a beautiful thing at the same time because you know what? There can be some freedom. So it's going to be a brutal thing. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I'm breaking up with fear. Calm down. If it was your spouse looking at you like you're crazy, like fear, fear. We're breaking up with fear in this month of November. And the reason I'm doing this series is because many of us are waiting for change in 2019. If you're waiting for change in 2019, you're in fear. Change should start like now. Today. Hebrews 11, when God begins to talk to us about faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things. So it's right now. I would say right now. So we got to address some stuff right now. But before we do, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just the word that you have given us in your Bible, Father. You've given us so much richness. I'm not coming up with any new revelation. It's all in your word, Father. It's very clear. It's the written rhema word. And I pray that as we all sit here and as we listen to the messages, Father, that, that there are things that are convicting, correcting, and, and, and instructing us, Father, in order for us to live a fearless life for you. I, I thank you, Father, that you who has begun the good work in each and every single person will fulfill that work, Father. Lord, I know that we weren't born just to survive. I know that we were not born just to work a job, pay the bills, hang out with family, celebrate birthdays, and die. That's not your will for us. That's the added blessing. And so, Lord, I pray that there's going to be some great discovery of people's greatest potential. Because they're breaking up with fear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So listen, last week I said, not all fear is bad fear. Let's just, let's just be straight up. Not all fear is bad fear. Uh, we talked about last week, there, there are two, there's only two, two kinds of fear that we were born with. Listen to the message. But not all fear is bad fear. As a matter of fact, there is such thing as healthy fear. And then there is such thing as toxic fear. I'm, I'm trying to expose the toxicity that we have in our lives. Kind of like when you eat bad all your life, you can become very toxic, right? Well, in your spirit, man, or in your soul, man, when you're constantly meditating and chewing on so much of fear, you become very toxic. You become so toxic is that, that you, start, you start making decisions based on fear, not faith. But fear has many faces. Fear has many disguises. Fear comes in different packages. And we need to be honest and be open today and say, okay, just maybe. Look at your neighbor and say, just maybe he's going to be talking about me. So last week we talked about the fear of the future. How many were here for last week for the fear of the future? And, and we discovered that there's no possible way for you and I to have a fear of the future. And the reason being is because you ain't living in the future yet. So how can you be afraid of something in the future that you have yet to even step into? So the truth is that we're not afraid of the future. We're afraid of the past that keeps dictating the future. We're afraid of what happened 
in the past experience, in past relationships, in past events, in past trauma, and they become the triggers of the future things that we think. Have you ever had a conversation with yourself? Like, you want that raise, but you start going in there with every possible idea of why you wouldn't get the raise. Right? Or you meet a person, and you have a false expectation. Maybe you thought, well, man, if I bring them in my circle, maybe they're not going to be loyal. Maybe they're not going to be dependent. So you, you literally, you talk yourself out of a blessing because of fear. Just like so many times. Jesus said, and by the stripes of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you were healed. You know what we do? We talk ourselves out of our healing. God's saying, I want you to talk yourself into your healing. Talk yourself into your breakthrough. Talk yourself into your restoration. You got to talk yourself into that. Amen. But fear keeps us from talking into our future, speaking life into our future. So let me sum it up last week real quick. Let me sum it up. Sum it up. When we say the, fe the, the, the fear of future, we're basically saying that it's the fear of what could happen is based on what did happen. I'm going to say this again. The fear of what could happen is based on what did happen. The f that's the, and, and, and don't we always think of what could happen? What could go wrong? <laughs> what could go bad? What if I leave this job and I take on this new job? But then all of a sudden, the economy hits another, another recession. And then I, I had a good here. And, and, and so it's the fear of what could happen is based on what did happen. Because we've all experienced a bad economy at some point, right? Recession. Everybody got hit. Everybody lost money. I know we did. We lost everything in our, in our, in our 401K and all these. Other, lost it. Get it. And so now you get, you get, you get scared to invest again. Doesn't that happen with us with people too? We get scared to invest trust in people again because of a past experience. Amen? So fear, let's get the acronym back out again. Fear is future events already ruined. Future events. You already jacked it up. You haven't even started. You already messed it up. You have an idea of wanting to buy a house. We're like, no, I'm not going to buy a house because, you know, if the economy, once again, the economy, you know, that job or, 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 or you're healing, whatever. You finish the sentence, but it's basically, it's future events already ruined. We ruin it before we even get started. And God's saying, we got to break up with fear. Hashtag break up with fear. Hashtag no miss church November. How many were here last weekend? Let me see your hands. You were here. You guys are awesome. Who wasn't here last weekend? Just your hand. Shame on you. Shame on you. So fearful. I'm just kidding. No, it's all good. You're here. But, but the, if you miss church, say this. Go, hashtag, no miss church November. <laughs> Watch last week's sermon so you catch up because I laid a lot of foundation last week. So today I want to talk to you about this fear. The fear of running your race. Now listen, if you read through the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote so many letters to the church. And he used many illustrations on of sport illustrations and, and, and racing illustrations. And he basically said that we, we have been given a race. You have been given a purpose. Now, I know that many of us are saying, well, I'm living on purpose. You know, I don't know who you're talking to. I'm, I'm living on purpose. Yeah, no. There's your purpose and there's, then there's divine purpose. See, there's your purpose without God and then there's divine purpose with God. Right? Let's say you're a business owner. That's awesome. I applaud you. Yay. But is Jesus in that business? Right? Uh, let's say you're in management. Yay. But is Jesus in that management? So there's, there's your purpose and then there's divine purpose where God is in the midst of whatever it is that he has called you to. Not everyone's called to ministry. Right? Not everyone is called to be a business owner. But we're all called to be his children. And if you be his children, then you'll do the divine thing he's called you to do and not just live a purpose life that's driven by fear, which is, which is where most people live today. When, when, when we learn how to be sons and daughters, we will do what God has called us to do. But when you don't know that you're his son, when you don't know that you're his daughter, you're going to do a lot of doing, and you're not going to be a lot of being. And God wants us to be more than he wants us to do. I'm going to say that again. God wants us to be more than he wants us to do. But we as church people, we're good doers, aren't we? 
We just do and more doo-doo. <laughs> then you wonder why you're in the doo-doo because we ain't being. Are you hearing me today? So I want to talk to you about running free, not running afraid. We want to run free with God. We want to run with knowing who we are in Jesus. We want to run not only knowing who we are in Jesus, but knowing the gifts he's placed in us, knowing the talent that he's placed in us, knowing the potential that's inside of every single one of you, regardless of your pedigree. I don't care if you come from poverty. Just because you come from poverty doesn't mean you have to keep living in poverty. I don't care if you come from a generational family line of divorce. Just because everyone in your family was divorced doesn't mean you're going to have to get a divorce. I don't care if you had three uncles, two aunts, and a cousin who had cancer. That doesn't mean that you're going to have cancer. We need to stop the curse. And the only way to stop the curse is to break up with fear because fear will drive you the rest of your life and you will talk yourself into cancer. It's true. And I'll explain it right now so you don't get all freaked out. But how many know that fear is sneaky? It creeps in. It doesn't just show up on your door like, hey, can I come in today? No, it just sneaks in. It's just, it takes you by surprise. Before you know it, you were never afraid of heights and now you're afraid of heights. Anyone when you were younger, you were not afraid of heights. And now you're older and now you're scared. Of, you're, you don't even know why. Because it's sneaky. It gets in in some way. There's a path. There's a door. Something happens. But until you see it for what it is, it's going to be hard to have the right relationship with fear. Because there is such thing as healthy fear. Listen to last week. That was healthy fear. Okay. So how do you know if fear is running your life? Everybody say running. running. Yeah. How do you know if fear is running your life? Here we go. Let's, let's expose some truths here. Number one. A perfectionist. Any perfectionist in the house? Woo, yeah, yeah. Th let me tell you, that's fear. A perfectionist is when you're afraid of criticism. Let's just talk about criticism. At Elevate Church, after every single service, including my sermon, we go back behind the doors and we critique every single service because we want it to improve. So people that are perfectionists, they twist critique with criticism and so they're afraid to be criticized they're afraid of failure they're afraid of rejection they're afraid of not being good enough perfectionists obviously in all reality and all truth they're man pleasers the reason that we're so we want to be so perfect at everything is because we don't want to disappoint anybody so we become these perfectionists well let me tell you something that is stem to fear and that will kill you it'll kill you. you'll be perfect but you're 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 stressed you're worried you're anxious you have high blood pressure all this perfectionist and and i and i'll be i'm gonna tell myself i'm a little perfectionist i am because i want everything excellent but sometimes i confuse excellence with perfectionist god said i'm an excellent god Right? He's an ex. My, the only standard I have is to be excellent. God's standard is to be perfect. Amen? But how many know that he perfects what concerns you? It didn't say you perfect what concerns you. He perfects what concerns you. What do we keep doing? We keep trying to perfect everything. And so now we're killing ourselves. The mask of perfection also separates you from what you really want. And you know what, what people, people that perfectionists really want? They just want to feel accepted, not rejected. They want to feel like they belong. They want to feel like, like, like you value, you value us for who we are and not what we do. Perfectionists feel like the only way I get my value is by what I do for you. And that is fear. Fear of failure. Fear of criticism. You're afraid of rejection. You're afraid of not being good enough. And the reality is that we want to make sure that we feel like we are accepted. Number two, procrastination. Let me see how my procrastinators in the house. I was not good. You should have, should have done that. <laughs> procrastination. Now, listen, I know that procrastination is you have priorities. But then there's other, those other type of procrastinators. There's two kind of procrastinators. Let me be straight up. There's the procrastinators that just, they leave everything for tomorrow. But it's a lifestyle. Like, even their hair gets left over for tomorrow. It's like everything. It's, it's tomorrow. It's just, it's a lifestyle. You procrastinate in 
everything of your life. It's just procrast- that that's just known called that's called lazy, okay? That's that's not the procrastination I'm talking about. The procrastination that I'm talking about is the procrastination that has a Pharaoh spirit. Remember Pharaoh? God God sends Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And what did Pharaoh keep saying? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. And every time he said tomorrow, he lost more. You know what happens with us in our procrastination? Sometimes you procrastinate in your health. You know that you're not healthy physically. You know that you may not be healthy in, let's just call it uh, maybe a, a disease called diabetes or, or, or whatever. You, you, you fill in the blank. But you keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. And you keep putting off your health. You keep putting, you want to take off some weight. But because you keep putting it off, you keep putting on more weight. And, And we procrastinate over and over. Also, we procrastinate sometimes in the unity of our family. Oh, I'll forgive them tomorrow. Then we'll get it right. Well, we'll have, well, Thanksgiving's coming. I'll apologize on Thanksgiving Day. Praise God. I'll be thankful for you procrastination we just wait we procrastinate some of us you know what we procrastinate in our finances man you got more month than you do money you're still paying the same credit card and it's been five years and it was only for like five thousand dollars what is wrong procrastination there is no urgency there is no sense of excellence to say you know what this is sinful this is not good procrastination can you relate to that Okay, so procrastination, procrastination replaces motivation. That's why people, listen, that's why people don't take care of it now. Because they lack motivation. Motivation should replace procrastination. Get some motivation. Wake up every day knowing, man, I'm going to do something awesome today. Number three, control. Remember Janet Jackson? Do you guys remember her song, Control? 90s, I know, I keep bringing up all the 90s. We're we're young. 90s. Control. We're just controlling. Losing control is terrifying. People that want control tend to keep everything in life the same. Like, like, let's not invite anybody else in this inner circle. Like, it's us four no more. We're good. Let's control this. You know what I'm saying? We're good. We're, we're, nobody Rock the boat. We've all been good. Uh, It's stable. It's good. Don't change it. You know, some of us haven't even changed our style for like a bazillion years. Control. We just want to control everything. But how many know that in life, things change? Culture changes. Society changes. And it's not that we're going to compromise and change by compromising our walk with God. But we are going to come to a compromise to where we can be a little bit more relevant for people to know Jesus. Amen? And so when you're afraid, you feel like, like you need to micromanage everything. Huh? Any micromanagers in the house? Yeah, because you think you can do it better? Here's another one. Here's a big one, okay? Sickness. Ever say Sickness. Sickness, it, we already know that it's caused by a multitude of illnesses. I get that. But having symptoms of physical sickness can also come from fear. It really does. Um, fear isn't just an uncomfortable emotion, okay? It's not just feeling uncomfortable that holds you back from following the dreams that God has for you. But it also triggers stress. Fear will, will trigger stress uh, it'll, it'll, it'll trigger responses in your body that you didn't have before. Um, they will put you at risk for disease. They will make it hard for the body to heal itself when you're constantly in fear. Um, fearful people are more likely to get heart attacks. This is, this, is, this is scientifically proven. People that live in fear are more likely to get heart attacks, cancer, diabetes they have autoimmune diseases they have inflammatory disorders chronic pain and even the common cold and they're also more likely to experience milder symptoms like insomnia low energy obesity dizziness headaches backaches uh, gastrointestinal distress i know people that are just they're wonderful they're amazing They know the word, but they're always sick, 
always, let me tell you something, at some point you have to realize that if you're always sick with the cold, the flu, the this, the that, the this, the, it's a curse that has come to you to put you down and make you feel like you can never get up. And listen, it can become chronic. You can become sick spiritually. Your soul can be so, so toxic with fears. Have you ever met those people that like, like oh, oh, what was that? Let's go Google it. And we Google every sickness because we want to name it. We want to name that, that sickness. We want to name that disease. We want to make sure that we understand. And I get it. You should know what's happening in your body. But there are Christians that are always sick. Always. What happened to you now? Where were you this week? Oh, we had the cold. Oh, all, all my family had the cold. Oh, all the neighborhood had the cold. Everybody, the whole city had the cold. Everybody had the cold. And it's like, what is, that's fear. Do you know anyone like that? They're always sick. The household is always sick. That's the spirit. Let me tell you that right now. It, fear has many roots. And until you identify them, you will not be able to come out of them and start getting victory in that life that you need. And, and let me tell you something. There have been some curses in my family that when, when I came to Christ with my family, I literally spoke it out. I said, okay, today I am breaking the curse, and I started naming all of them. We ain't having that. I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to break up with fear. So if you're always sick, don't get upset at me. No, it's true. You got you to kick it out. You got to talk yourself into your healing, not keep talking yourself more into your healing. We talk more about everything. Man, I'm preaching it. Don't worry, relax. I'm doing it. My mom. I love my mom. I love my mom. But I had to correct it. I'm like, Mom. Like, we just sat here for like five minutes. You told me everything's wrong with you. Like, tell me everything that's right with you. Come on, some of us, this is the only conversation we have. Do you know, some of you may be like, dang, he's so mean to his mom. No, I love my mom. I want my mom healthy, whole, healed, not broken, busted, disgusted. Some of us are too afraid to be bold and say, hey, listen, let's stop that conversation and let's speak life over this situation. Right? You don't want to hear that. I know. Okay, let's go another one. Oh, here's you right here. Here's you. Number five, anger and hatred <laughs> are manifestations of fear that are directed outwardly at someone else. Okay, but listen to me. But, but while guilt and shame is directed inwardly, have you ever heard of that person say, I have self-hatred? Let me explain to you where self-hatred came from. Self-hatred didn't just birth in you. Self-hatred was birthed based on a past experience that you had with someone who did something so horrific and painful towards you that all of a sudden you find yourself years later almost looking or identifying with that experience so much that it becomes a little bit of you. And before you know it, you look at yourself and you hate you. You have self-hatred because there are things in your life that have, have, have kept you in shame and guilt and condemnation. And that's the spirit of fear. There is no shame with God. There is no guilt with God. There is no condemnation with God. But there is correction with God. Don't get it twisted. There's something called conviction, and that comes from the Holy Spirit. And when he convicts you, he compels you through his love to change. So, so that, that is a, a anger and hatred. These are all manifestations of this fear that we hold on to. Number six, this one will be good. How about this one? When you settle. When you settle, you do this. It's when you're afraid to take risks and, and, and go for what you really want. But you convince yourself that you're less than. Like some of you, you know that you can be in management, but you can't see yourself that way. You know why? Because you compromise with the uh, quote-unquote, uh, let's be realistic. I don't have the smarts to do that. I'm not intelligent. I, I don't even have a degree. I, I didn't even go to college for that. That's, see, that's that's. That's living your purpose. 
But when you live divine purpose, man, you start thinking a little bit different. I can do that. Have you ever done it before? Nope. Well, how do you know you can do it? Well, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. Now, I ain't stupid either. I'm going to go figure it out. I'm not just going to wait for fairy dust to fall from heaven like, ooh, I'm, I'm one. No. Listen, some of you, the only reason you un, you're unqualified is because you already qualified yourself unqualified. That's the only reason. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? You know, God, life was hard. God's God, like, I gave you my spirit. I gave you the spirit of wisdom. I gave you the spirit of knowledge. I gave you the spirit of revelation. Hey, I gave you a brain. And you didn't, and you didn't, and you didn't exercise it. We, we need, we need to break up with fear, church. There's too many Christians. Listen, the world is more bold than most Christians. It's sad. Christians have more excuses than the world does. The world will show up on time while Christians are always showing up late. And then we want the world to know our Jesus. No, maybe, just maybe, man, our fear has kept us from knowing the real Jesus. And we have a superficial Jesus in the church. This isn't to get, you know, harsh. This is to be brutal. Look at your neighbor and be like, it's okay. He's talking about me. Just, yeah. Yeah. Okay, look, 2 Timothy 1.7, are you guys doing okay? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's, go, let's go back to the foundational scripture. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, for God has not, everybody say not. not. For God has not given us a spirit of what? So, so God didn't give us that. God, God's like, I, I didn't give you all the things that Mauricio just mentioned. He's like, I didn't give you any of those. We said last week, too many of us have borrowed fear. From other people's past experiences. They weren't even our fears to, to begin with. We just borrowed them and we haven't given them back. You've borrowed that fear from that person, that fear from that person. We've borrowed so much fear from everybody, we don't even know which is ours and which is theirs. So we borrow fear. But God says, what's wrong with you? Why are you borrowing fear when I have given you my spirit of what? Power, love, and a sound mind. He says, that's the spirit I give you. And how many know that when you run a race, you need power in your legs. Let's just take the, the, the tangible, obviously. When you run, you need strength in your legs. Well, guess what? If you're going to run for God on this earth, man, you got to have the spirit of power inside of you in order to accomplish what he designed you to do. The problem is that this, Satan, Satan created fear by default while God created faith by design. And too many of us keep defaulting into fear and not living by design. And then we're just like, I wonder how, how, come, how come we're still poor? How come we're not? How come our family's jacked up? How come? Because we keep defaulting to what we really live. But we can change. All of us can change. I have identified, as I've been like studying, I'm identifying some fears in my personal life. Do you know that the only person that can limit, elevate church from its fullest potential of what God wants to see is me? And you. And you. You know why? You call this your home, your house of worship. But even you can limit what God wants to do. Because it's us four. We all go, why? Why do we have to have more people here, Pastor? Because the world needs saving. No, you just want numbers. Well, no, God does because he wrote a book called Numbers in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were saying? Yeah. See, it's not about numbers. It's about the number of salvations that are going to come through this church. Last weekend, 40 salvations. 40, 40, 4, 0, 40. 38, 38 inside this building, 2 on live stream. I received Christ today. And if you're watching on live stream, please stay connected. God is reaching his people. But God said, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and a what? Okay. But this is what the Christian like looks like. As, uh, Gus, Gus, are you here? Can you help me? How many remember the seesaw? Woo! Yeah, the seesaw. Y'all remember? Woo! This is what, this is what. This is what Christians look like, actually. 
It's the truth. One moment, you're really to risk it all. You're like, man, I'm a risk taker. I'm a history maker. I believe you, Jesus. The next moment, you're like, oh, my God, I can't. <laughs> next moment, <laughs> Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. Yeah, all things through Christ Jesus who gives me the strength. And then someone tells you, no, you can't. You're like, oh, I can that, that's, that's how we live. Come on, another moment. We're saying things like this, like, man, Lord, I know that it's by your stripes that I am whole, healed, delivered, set free. You've been praying tongues, right? Then the doctor says, oh, we found something else. You're like, oh, you did? How about today? Hey, guess what? <laughs> I forgive you, man. I know that you, you meant to hurt me, but God delivered me. I forgive you, forgive you, forgive you. And then the next time, like, psych, no, I don't. <laughs> and you take it back. Today, you're emotionally stable. Praise the Lord. No, today, I'm going to have devotion time. I'm going to be focused. I'm not going to let my feelings of whatever um, get the best of me. In the name of Jesus, I have the Holy Spirit, and he is my emotion. I have power, I have love, and I have a sound mind until something happens. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> and so here's what happens. We seesaw as Christians. Every day we're so unstable. One moment we believe God, the next moment we don't. The next moment we know that God's going to move for us, the next moment we feel he's not. The next moment we know that, hey, I can do this. I can do this call. The next moment, I don't know if I can do this call. The next moment, hey, I should start coming to church every Sunday. Next moment, something happens. Uh, let's miss church today. Yes or no? Let's keep it real. Don't, let's, let's not lie in church. Let's be honest. We all hit that place. Hey, let's set our alarm. We're going to be there early. Hey, let's turn it off. Hey. <laughs> Hey, today God's going to speak a word. Hey, maybe not. Maybe men on live stream. And we seesaw. I won't do this to you. I won't drop you. When I was a kid, I used to bring them up and I would get off. But I won't do that to you. I love you. Anybody ever do that when you were a kid? Man, I used to. The girls were okay. It was the guys that were like, help me, Jesus. Yeah, come on. One moment. I'm a giant slayer. Next moment, I'm slayed. Next moment, I'm with you. Next moment, <laughs> see ya. It's a seesaw. We live in the spirit of fear and we make every decision based on the emotion or the feeling that we have, based on the past experience. And then we wonder why can't we get to God's future? You'll never get to God's future until you crush and slay your past. It's not going to happen. Amen. Are you guys getting this? All right, let's hurry up. First John 4, 18. So, so let's, I want to get back into this because this is important. So John 4, 18 says this. There is no fear in love but perfect. Everybody say perfect. But perfect love will cast out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears. Everybody say he who fears. Any, any fear, but he who's afraid, and you may have one or two or three or four or five different, different fears that you're dealing with, but he who fears has not been perfected by God's love. That's the only reason that some of us aren't so much further along in life because you know what? I know there is so much potential here. I know many of you. You have a lot of potential, but the only reason, I'm here from my mouth, the only reason you're not further is because you haven't experienced, you've experienced, you've experienced the love of the church, but you have not experienced the love of the bride of Christ. You have not experienced Jesus. When you experience Jesus, you will not be afraid regardless of your past. When you're still afraid of your past, it will constantly paralyze you from getting you into your future. It will. You'll be spiritually paralyzed. You, you'll always be one woman, one woman, you're all in it for God. They're like, on fire for God. Yay. The next minute, they're just, they're put out. They're like, are you, hello, how are you okay? Yeah, everything's good. What, what, what? seesaw? Up and down, up and down. But the perfect love 
that we talked about last week is the love from above. It's, it's listen, God is a perfect parent. He's a daddy. He's a father. I don't think, I don't think the church knows the father yet very well. I think, I think we've heard of him, but not many of us know him. People ask me, aren't you afraid? What if the cartel kills you when you're getting deeper into rescuing kids? Because we're about to go deep into this. Love has perfected my concern. We had our board meeting yesterday, or the day before. I forgot what day it was. And everyone's like, listen, right now, I, I, I just made friends with an FBI agent who's going to start giving us top cover when we're in Mexico. Now, once we get into the trafficking part, okay, and, and he's like, hey, listen, we're going we're gonna to give you top cover. So every time you're there, agents will be there to, to make sure you're good and everything. But, but the question was, but aren't you guys afraid? What if, what if they kill you? Perfect love has already cast out that fear. I can't explain it. I even tell them, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand it. I can walk the streets. I'm not afraid. I'm not, there's something beautiful when you can live your life knowing that at any moment someone can kill you. And you're just like, I'm not even thinking about it. Because I'm not thinking about dying, I'm thinking about living. And too many of us are thinking about dying, and we're not thinking about living. Too many of us are, are thinking about what won't happen instead of thinking about, but what can happen. We're just stuck, and, and we're just, we just keep living there because the past experience is more powerful than a God who prophesies into our future. And that is sinful. All of those I called out is sin. Procrastination is sin. What else did I call out? Procrastination, what else? Control is sin. What else? Y'all take notes here in this church? Sickness. If it wasn't sin, then Jesus would have never crushed sickness or disease. It's sin. It's sin on the earth. It's not you. It's sin on the earth. What else did I say? Anger, hatred, perfectionist, sin. Settling. We've got too many settlers in the church. That's why the church struggles. Do you know that there's only 1% in America of churches that actually can, can build big buildings for God and reach the masses? Because only 1% gets it. They get that, wait a minute, I'm on this earth to advance the kingdom of God. I'm not on this earth to be comfortable, to make a paycheck, to pay for my bills, to pay for my children, and to die, and that's it. That's not the church. The church is born to move, to reach. How sad would it be if Elevate Church only does what it's doing for the rest, rest of its life? That would be shame on us. It's, I hate when people are like, Pastor, what are you going to do? I'm like, you know, what are you going to do? Why do you always put the pressure on me? What are you going to do? How are you going to help? It's, oh, Pastor, where are, you where are you leading us? I can use some encouragement too, you know. I can use some prayer too, you know. I don't need, it. I don't need people to tell me why are we doing stuff on Halloween and getting letters like another one I got. My thing is like, Show me, the, show me the bill what you paid for. Show me where you sacrificed. Where were you? Show me the souls you won. False information. I've had people tell me, you didn't even do a salvation call. Duh, there was like 39 salvations that night in our show alone. What are you talking about? What are you saying? We got to wake up. We just keep talking about. Oh, well, that happened, and that happened, and that happened. And you know what's sad? The sad is that, the sad part is that, yes, we have to be compassionate of people's trauma. But you know what's sad? Is when we have the greatest Savior, the greatest healer, the greatest provider, the greatest deliverer, and that has more power than him. That's sad. That's sad. And you know what's even more sad? That some of us, because we refuse to go into God's promised land, will be no different than the Israelites, will die in the desert. But I'm praying and believing God that you, the church, you, Elevate, 
is not going to die in the desert. We're going to make it into the promised land of God for every single one of you personally, corporately, as a family. Together we're going to do this. Amen. Everybody say, God's a perfect parent. Hebrews 12, 1 through 7. Quickly, let's go. Quickly. Are you guys okay? We're almost done. I'm gonna, I'm, I had more stuff. I'm going to cut it. Hebrews 12, 1 through 7 says this. He says, a huge, a huge cloud of witnesses is all around us. What does that mean? Let me just say it. When, when, when God said, run your race, you're not running alone. There's actually angels in heaven that are looking down at you, watching you run, saying, look, Carlos, don't you dare stop. Get up. Run, but I fell. Though a man may fall seven times, he'll rise again. Though a woman may fall seven times, she'll rise again. You're going to rise again. Run, run. You know why? Because the finish line will never change. The finish line will remain. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Maybe you've been unfaithful to God, but aren't you glad that though you and I sometimes in our walk with God, we've been unfaithful, he is always faithful. God never changes the line says, oh, yeah, you know, forget about it. You're out. God doesn't do that. Heaven says, run, run. And you know what? An Elevate Church, the right people around you, having the right relationships around you, there should be people in the church that should be telling you, run. Don't stop. You got this. Keep going. Stop saying you can't. Stop saying you're going to quit. Stop saying, stop it and run. That's why he says, man, there's a cloud, of, a huge, everybody say huge. That's where Trump got that from. It's going to be huge. But check this out. Okay, but, okay, so, so heaven, their responsibility is to cheer you on. You know what your responsibility is? Is to throw off some things. He says, so let us throw off some things, my bad. So let us throw off a fraction of our stuff. So let us throw off everything that stands in our, what's getting in front of your race? Look, look. Let us throw off any what? That holds on to us, so what? Who's holding on to you? Gus, where'd you go? Quickly. This is us. You may be in your call. You're in your profession. I do love souls. I do. But, but then you get comfortable. You know how you get comfortable as a Christian? Like you start off on fire, then you're just like watered down. You know who you are, right? And then so, so Satan does this. He makes you think you're running. <laughs> and then, but what happens? That's weight. And weight is sin. And you're trying... And you get a little bit. But then what does he do? He, he's holding on tightly. And you're like, come on, man. And he's just like, and I'm like, come on. And, and you just, and listen, it's, it's not funny. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. We're more acquainted. Thank you. You can let go of me. <laughs> We're more acquainted with our sin than we are with our father. We hug sin. We reject Father. And so he says, and let us keep on. Stay with me, guys. Ready? And let us keep on. The race that was what? Let us keep looking to who? When you get your eyes off Jesus, you know you live in fear. You do. When I have taken my eyes off Jesus as the senior pastor of Elevate Church, which I have done more than once, in the last eight years that this church has existed, I have found myself in fear. And when I have found myself overcoming those fears, it was because I put my eyes back on the prize. His name is Jesus. Maybe your eyes are off Jesus. Put them back on. He's giving us the process. Let us keep looking to Jesus. He is the one who started this journey of faith, and he is the one who will finish this journey of faith. Aren't you glad that there's an author who already wrote out your story? Stop changing it. Stop altering it. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. And he is the one who completes the journey of faith. He paid no attention to the shame. Look at that. Do you know that shame is, is an extension of fear, right? So let's read it this way. And he paid no attention to the fear of the cross. You know why? 
because he suffered there because of the joy he was looking forward to. You know what that joy was? You. Look at your neighbor and be like, dang, he was looking at you. He was looking at you. He was looking at you, man. He was looking at you. He saw your face and he said, I'm not afraid of the cross. He saw you at your worst moment with the glasses, at your lowest point of life. I ain't afraid. Felicia, at our lowest moment, in our greatest fear, in our greatest disgust, in our deepest sin, and he said, I'm not afraid of your sin. I'm not afraid of your failure. I'm not afraid of your mistake. I'm not afraid of your losses. I'm not afraid of your setbacks. You know what? He says, because I'm going to come back. And he, look, and, and, and he said this. And so it was the joy that was, I was looking forward to. Then he sat down. Everybody say, then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he made it through these attacks by sinners. So think about him. So every time you're being hit, think about him. Think about what he did for you on the cross. Let that cross be your joy. Hey, man, <laughs> he, yeah, he nailed that one too. Yeah, I think he nailed that one too. Yeah, where I missed it, he nailed it once and for all. And then you won't get tired. Ever say you won't get tired. When you have your eyes on Jesus, you won't get tired. When you get, off, get your eyes off Jesus, you're tired. You're a tired Christian. You're exhausted. You're just, just, uh, how you doing? Uh, you're quitting everything. Uh, you, we use the God card. Uh, the Lord is calling me to step down. The Lord is calling me to sit back. The Lord is calling me to somewhere. No, you got tired and weary, and now you're letting the spirit of fear just keep holding you tight. And God says, stop letting sin hold you tight. Stop it. You won't lose hope when you keep your eyes on Jesus. God trains his children. Verse 4, you struggle against sin, but you have not yet fought to the point of spilling your blood. Yes, I'm being attacked on every side, but you have yet to, you have yet to, to see your blood just, ah. in other words, I'm all in, Jesus. Man, so what? The enemy has cut me. I have the biggest open, because I have an open heart surgery to remove a mass. Every time I look, I'm like, dang, my blood was spilled. You know why? Because it took every bit of my faith to trust in the only one who can heal me from cancer. The only one. That took a spilling of blood. You're sitting here today because you have spilled your blood. You have said, man, there's times where I want to be unfaithful to God, but I have spilled it all out so I can stay faithful to him. Give your big, yourselves a big hand clap because you were faithful today. You spilled it out. Verse 5, have you, have you completely forgotten this word of hope? Look at your neighbor and say, did you forget about this? That's how some people smack people. Yeah, smack some people. What's wrong? Let's go back to the 90s. You guys remember uh, Homie Don't Play That? I mean, we need to get a few satchels up in this church. Like, homie Don't Play That. All the younger people are like, what is that? Praise God. Just tell the millennials, shh, Homie Don't Play That. Look, have you completely forgotten this word of hope? It speaks to you as a what? Have you completely forgotten this word of hope? It speaks to you as a to his. When you read your Bible, he speaks to you as a daddy. It says, my son, my daughter, think of the Lord's training as important. Do not lose hope when he corrects you. In other words, people here sometimes they get upset because I say things they don't like. I'm not saying it. I'm just the messenger. Whom the Lord loves, he what? Corrects. We're not just here to get a flowery message so you feel better about yourself. We're here to get a message that's going to bring conviction to break the shame 
the guilt and the condemnation off of us because we're breaking up with fear. So whom the Lord loves, he corrects. He corrects us as a father would correct us. Do not lose hope when he corrects you. The Lord trains the one he loves. He corrects everyone he accepts as his son. Put up with hard times. Put up with hard times. Stop, stop making an excuse because you're in hard times. He said put up with it. Faith puts up with it. Love puts up with it. Hey, we have to put up with you. Let's put up with people because we love. And love will cast out all fear. He says put up with hard times. Put up with it. And in America, we're seeing hard times from killings to fires to, but we're going to put up with hard times. We're going to faith all the more. We're going to believe God all the more. We're going to love people all the more. We're going to reach people all the more. We're not just going to sit there and be like, oh, my God, did you see what happened now? Man, we're going to put up. It's a hard, yeah, it's a hard time. But my God is filled with grace. My God is filled with mercy. God uses them. Look at this. He uses them to train you. He is treating you as his children. And what children are not trained by their parents? <sighs> what parent doesn't train his child to not be afraid? You'd have to be a wicked parent not to prepare and train your child on how to face this world. <coughs> that is cowardness when you don't train your child to face a hard time. It's not good. So God's saying in the word, so let this fear be the training wheels. God's saying, don't be dismayed. But realize that what the devil meant for bad, I'm going to use it for something good. In other words, God's saying, I ain't going to waste your sins. I'm not going to waste your failures. I'm not going to waste your mistakes. I'm not going to waste your mess ups. I'm going to use everything to get you to experience my unconditional love that will compel you to run the race. Gus, come back up here. Get up here, Gus. Be nice to me. So you can keep seesawing. One moment you're in, next moment you're out. I'm a Christian today, I'm not tomorrow. I love God today, not feeling it tomorrow. I'm ready to serve, I don't feel I should serve. I'm ready to love, I'd rather hate. And you just keep living this way every day. Isn't this exhausting? It's annoying, isn't it, just watching me do this right now? I'm annoyed. I had Katrina tell me, she's like, oh, my God, it's so annoying watching me. I'm like, I was up there. She's, she was, she, we, we feel, we, we connect, we know. We all know this. But check this out. Think about this. Think about this. When you and I aren't free from fear, here's why. Because we let Satan take the ground. He said, let him who stole steal no longer. And you know what we do while we're up here? We're doing this. We're running. I'm running, pastor, look at me. I'm not with, I'm, we're not here every month, but we're, we're here every so often. But check this out. Jesus said this, I'm in, I'm in him and he's in me and without him I can do what nothing so you go down and you get grounded in God's love and you'll keep fear at bay but it comes with perfect love when you finally know love when you finally know the real Jesus not the pretend Jesus not the holiday Jesus not the Christmas Jesus the Easter Jesus huh not that Jesus when you know Love, when you know perfect love, that love will keep you grounded and you'll cast out all fear. And then when you're grounded, you can run. You can run. And that's what God wants from all of us. We need to be grounded deep 
in the love of the Father because you know what? Some of us, there's beyond, there's things I haven't even hit here yet. Fears that, that you and I already know about. Love, everybody say love. Say Abba. That's, that means God, Abba, means Father. Abba Daddy, Abba Father is the only one who can cast out all fear. No other way. No other way. It's, if we will keep being dysfunctional, church, until we know love. We'll keep being traumatic. We'll keep being triggered. We'll keep quitting. We'll keep giving up. We'll keep giving in. We'll keep compromising. We'll keep lying. We'll keep cheating. We'll keep sinning if we don't get perfect love in us that can cast out all that fear. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.